Hey, it's Sheila Social Studies. Hey guys, and welcome back to Sheila Social Studies. Okay, so we covered the first Continental Congress, right? They sent the Declaration of Rights and Grievances to King George III. Now, now we're going to talk about that Continental Congress still meeting. I told you it met all throughout the war. It's not that there was a first Continental Congress and then they changed a whole bunch of people and then it was a second Continental Congress. This was just the different time that they met. Okay, so when King George refused to acknowledge the colonist declaration of rights, the Continental Congress decided to meet again. The Congress was made up of the same delegates from the colonies. This is just like the second major meeting of the Continental Congress, hence how it got its name. As British authority crumbled in the colonies, the Continental Congress effectively took over as the de facto national government, thereby exceeding the initial authority granted to it by the individual colonial governments. However, the local groups that had formed to enforce the colonial boycott continued to support the Congress. The Second Congress would continue to meet until March 1, 1781, when the Articles of Confederation that established a new national government for the United States took effect. By the time the Congress met again, war was already underway, and as a result, the delegates to the Second Continental Congress formed the Continental Army and dispatched none other than George Washington to Massachusetts as its commander. Congress also drafted the Olive Branch Petition, which attempted to suggest a means of resolving the differences and the disputes between the colonies and Great Britain. Congress sent that petition to King George III on July 8th, but he refused to receive it. As the de facto national government, the Continental Congress assumed the role of negotiating diplomatic agreements with foreign nations. The British Parliament banned trade with the colonies and authorized seizure of colonial vessels on December 23rd. These actions served to further erode the positions of anti-independence moderates in Congress and bolster those of pro-independence leaders. On April 6, 1776, Congress responded to Parliament's actions by opening American ports to all foreign ships except British vessels. Reports from American agent Arthur Lee in London also served uh, to support the revolutionary cause. Lee's report suggested that France was interested in assisting the colonies in their fight against Great Britain, which we know and what we've discussed before that they in helped uh, after the Battle of Saratoga. With a peaceful resolution increasingly unlikely, in 1775, Congress began to explore other diplomatic channels and dispatched Congressional Delegate Silas Dean to France in April of 1776. Dean succeeded in securing informal French support by May. By then, Congress uh, was increasingly conducting international diplomacy and had drafted the model treaty in which hoped to seek alliances with Spain and France. On July 1776, Congress took the important step of formally declaring the colonies independence from Great Britain with the writing of the Declaration of Independence. In September, Congress adopted the model treaty and then sent commissioners to France to negotiate a formal alliance. They entered into this formal alliance with France in 1778. Congress eventually sent diplomats to European powers to encourage support for the American cause and secure loans for the money-strapped war effort. Congress and the British government made further attempts to reconcile, but negotiation failed when Congress refused to revoke the Declaration of Independence, both in a meeting on September 11, 1776 with British Admiral Richard Howe and when a peace declaration from Parliament arrived in Philadelphia in 1778. Instead, Congress spelled out the terms for peace on August 14, 1779, which demanded British withdrawal, American independence, and navigation, on the, uh, navigation rights on the Mississippi River. The next month, Congress appointed John Adams to negotiate such terms with England, but British officials were evasive. 
Formal peace negotiations would have to wait until after the Confederation Congress took over the reins of government on March 1, 1781, following American victories at Yorktown that resulted in the British willingness to end the war. So you have to remember, these colonists, these delegates, tried to reach out to the king to say, hey, here's our grievances, here's our, uh, here's our rights. An olive branch petition, which is a peace petition. He just didn't even do anything with it. So our Continental Congress had to meet multiple times to try to figure out what we were going to do to get aid from France, to seek allies in Europe against Britain. And as we know now, all of this wound up working for the Continental Congress. See you next time on Seal of Social Studies.